Welcome back with a smiling face. Links to previous episodes are given in the video description, so don't forget to like, subscribe and share the video. Echoes of Shattered Destiny Episode 12 Chapter 88-93 I spent the day with Lola, immersed in work as I often was. With Lola destined to be my Luna, I knew she could handle the workload. Her loyalty to this pack was as strong as my own, and I knew there wasn't anything we wouldn't do for the benefit of our people. Running a pack was so much more than paperwork and brisk orders. You had to be willing to sacrifice yourself, your time, and your life. Being an alpha meant giving up your hopes and dreams, your hobbies and personal interests for the good of the pack. You sacrificed those things so that your people might have the opportunity to pursue what they love and enjoy. As soon as Bran and Zeke woke up, my day had begun. The three of us pulled thousands of warriors into this small town, preparing for the inevitable war. The downside of having a large army was providing them with the basic necessities of living. They needed places to sleep, food to eat, and room to breathe. The people of this pack were willing to volunteer their time and energy to help the troops, cooking food and providing places to live. Those with larger houses offered up guest rooms, opening their home to countless warriors. It was a debt I could never repay but something I was eternally grateful for. I opened my own home to many warriors, providing every last inch of space so that they might have a place to sleep, a roof over their heads. Even with the influx of volunteers and the use of the community center, there were some warriors forced to live in tents surrounding the pack. The pack house was open to those living in tents, providing showers and food when needed. Hours later, a headache throbbed at my temples, radiating across my forehead. The two of us had gotten a lot of work done, but there was always more. It was a never-ending stream of work, but the end was always worth it. You need a break. Lola grimaced, standing from the chair she sat at in my office. I watched as she approached me, hips swaying as they often did. The more time I spent with Lola, the more I was awed by her beauty. Completely oblivious, as she often was, she caught the eye of many males. None dared look longer than a few moments, seeing the cobalt mark on her neck, the mark of an alpha. Don't go. I sighed, pulling her small frame into my arms. I buried my face into the crook of her neck, the side with my mark, and inhaled deeply. Vanilla and pears, such a unique scent with a huge impact. I could feel my tense muscles relaxing as I held her in my arms, the spark licking their way up my skin. I wouldn't if I had a choice. Her voice was soft, and I nearly groaned as she ran her fingers through my hair. Her fingernails grazed my scalp, sending waves of delicious pleasure down my neck. I'm doing this for the pack. I'll KL my way out of that building to get back to you, I promise. I knew she would, I could hear the conviction in her words. She'd KL the Vampire King herself if it meant coming home to me. She stepped into the position of Luna unknowingly, and embraced every stressful, horrible aspect. I could hardly stomach the guilt that followed. Did I deserve someone so selfless? So irrevocably brave and fearless? You're too good for me, you know that. I mumbled against her neck. She shivered as my breath fanned across her neck, coaxing a wave of primal pleasure from my wolf. He wanted her here and now, as he had since we first met Lola. I had tried to keep my distance from her, to let her develop feelings on her own, but self-control had never been a strong suit of mine especially with my wolf breathing down my neck. She pulled herself away from me, making me grimace from the lack of comfort, the lack of Lola. She stared into my eyes searching for something, delving into their depths until she reached a part of my soul, I kept hidden, a part only she had access to. You're wrong. She shook her head. 
I let my eyes close as her fingers drifted over my stubble, tracing along my jawline softly. We're perfect for each other, that's why we're mates. You need someone willing to sacrifice just as much as you for the good of this pack. You don't have to handle this stuff alone anymore, let me help where I can. And right now, I'm helping you by making you take a break. Come take a bath with me. My wolf's ears perked up at her words, pride bursting through him as we gazed at our mate. I couldn't deny her, not when she was looking at me with those brilliant eyes. Staring at me as though I were the one thing, she had spent her life waiting for. Staring at me as though all the terrible rumors couldn't hide the person I truly was. It was a vulnerable feeling, but Lola was the only wolf I would ever submit to, my mate. I couldn't hide my interest at her words. Any chance to see her without those restrictive clothes was a blessing, and I planned on taking advantage of every opportunity. My lips twitched into a smirk, which soon turned into a grin when she scoffed at me. I let her tug me out of my office, leading me down the hall and into our bedroom. Her strength was no match for mine, even with her constant tugging, but I let her lead me nonetheless. I had quickly noticed Lola's second favorite place in the house was my massive bathroom, her first was the bed. I waited silently as she turned the tub on, sticking her finger under the stream to check the heat. She must have been thinking something particularly naughty, as when she turned around, blush had formed on her cheeks. I flashed her an innocent smile, tugging on the hem of her t-shirt. She let me slide it from her body forgotten on the floor. In my eyes, Lola had no imperfections. Every ounce of her creamy skin was alluring, seductive without even trying. A harsh blush stained her cheeks as my eyes drifted down her shoulders and to her chest. I tossed my own shirt to the floor, watching Lola in amusement. I had seen every inch of her supple body, had tasted every ounce of her delicious skin. She had been completely before me, back arched in toe curling pleasure, and yet she still blushed under my gaze. Even after all this time, you still blush when I have you undress for me. I smirked, chuckling softly. It's not my fault I have some decency. Lola snickered, looking me up and down. Decency. I snorted, my grin growing wider. Last I remember, I caught you swimming in your bra and panties. Lola glared at me, making me chuckle louder. She often reminded me of a kitten with its hackles raised, swiping with tiny paws and bared fangs. She was a formidable warrior against most, but I could handle her fire, her feistiness. No one else knew about the swimming hole. She shook her head her eyes practically burning holes into me as I removed the rest of my clothing. I'm still not sure how you knew about it. The way she looked at me started a fire deep in the pits of my stomach, those white eyes burning with need, need she wasn't sure how to act on. I patrolled the forest around this town extensively before attacking. I smirked, remembering how her previous alpha had overstepped had disrespected me to the point of no return. I found the swimming hole easily. When I saw you walk into the woods, I knew exactly where you had gone. And the moment we saw you, neither of us could resist. My wolf chuckled lowly, we had no choice but to follow. I tugged at the hem of her sweatpants, smirking when they fell to the floor. The burning in my gut raged on as she was completely to me. She no longer tried to hide herself, knowing I would only pull her hands away. With every beautiful inch of her on display, the temptation was nearly too much. She sank into the tub with a soft sigh, oblivious to how her relaxed purr affected me. I wrapped my hand around her submerged ankle, pulling her across the tub and into my arms. I chuckled as she rolled her eyes, but settled into my arms happily. Her eyes drifted down my face, lingering on my neck where her mark sat. Her gaze softened as it traced over the cobalt mark, 
and I found myself watching her silently, tracing the arch of her lips, the curve of her nose, and the deep color of her eyes. Your mark is healed. She smiled softly, her eyes roaming my face with gentle intimacy. I returned her gaze, taking in the beauty that was my mate, my Lola. The woman I knew I didn't deserve, yet had been blessed with anyway. My Luna, my equal in all forms, the only wolf I would ever submit to. As I had many times, I grabbed a bar of soap and moved to turn her around. I had washed her countless times, an excuse to graze her skin with my fingertips. Intimacy had never been a strong suit of mine, but I was determined to worship and appreciate every inch of Lola, every supple curve and gentle arch. You've washed me how many times now? She asked, it's your turn, now turn around. A lazy smile worked its way onto my face. I grabbed her hips, running my thumbs over her soft skin and placed her on my lap. I kept myself under control, desperately not wanting to take a cold shower later. I leaned back, resting against the ridge of the tub. Start with the front, darling. I grinned, laughing as she rolled her eyes. A beautiful blush stained her face, soft like rose petals. Her eyes betrayed her darkening as she took in my muscles. Alpha. She scoffed, sticking her tongue out at me. If only she knew what I wanted to do to her, the positions I'd have her in, the noises I'd coax from her plush lips. She ran the bar of soap across my chest, her fingers grazing over the planes of my muscles. My wolf growled pleasantly. Chapter 89 both Maddox and I slept in that morning, holding each other as we tried to prolong the inevitable. I would be leaving soon, and neither of us knew when I would return. I'd either return before my heat began, or suffer the consequences. My stomach was a mess of guilt and nerves, but Maddox's touch pushed the heavy emotions from my mind. As we laid in each other's arms, hands wandering over soft skin, the intimacy blossoming through me was stronger than I've ever felt. This morning wasn't about s asterisk x or burning physical need, it was about comfort, true companionship, and love. No one knows I'm leaving, right? I asked, pulling my head from Maddox's chest to look into his eyes. I don't want my family knowing until after I'm gone. It was selfish of me to think that way, but it would make things easier. I wasn't doing this for myself, but for this pack for Brianna and Giovanni. I now understood how Giovanni could turn his back on his species for Brianna, how the mate bond filled every aching hole in your soul. Only my Beta and Zeke will know. Maddox nodded, absent-mindedly running his fingers through my tangled hair. I'm afraid most of the pack already knows you're my mate, and they're Luna. Well that grabbed my attention. I pulled myself from Maddox's warm embrace, propping myself up on one of my elbows. Maddox didn't seem to mind that the pack knew, though I wondered how they came about that information. How? I asked, an eyebrow raised as I took in his amused expression. It seems your dad got excited when he heard his daughter was our future Luna. Maddox smirked his hair deliciously messy from sleep. He told a couple of his friends. Who in turn told the entire pack. I confirmed, snorting at the smile that had taken place on Maddox's face. I can't blame him. Maddox murmured, planting feather light kisses along my jaw and cheek. This pack is lucky to have you, a Luna willing to risk it all. Beautiful. Fearless there is no one more fit for the job. Plus, I know how to handle you. I smirked, though a blush had crept onto my cheeks at the sincerity of his words. After another hour in bed, I had no choice but to shower and get dressed for the long day ahead. Come tomorrow, I would no longer be in this pack and my future would be more uncertain than ever. I was on a mission, 
to safeguard this pack and hopefully ensure a long and happy life with Maddox by my side. I threw on something simple, a t-shirt and a pair of dark leggings. I wanted to get far away from the pack's territory line before calling on my father and his men. I wanted the wolves running patrol to remain safe, and keep another fight from brewing. Shortly after I had gotten dressed, Grandma called and asked me to join her for coffee. I knew I wouldn't have the chance to say goodbye to my family, but it was a risk I was willing to take. I was betting on my survival, on returning with crucial information about the upcoming war. Dad, Sean, and Grandma would be furious but they would live, and that was what mattered. I accepted her invitation, as it was the last chance. I'd have to see her. Maddox personally dropped me off at the coffee shop, giving me a lasting kiss that made me question if leaving was the right choice. It's for Brianna and Giovanni. My wolf reminded me, neither of us want to leave, but it's what Aluna would do. Two members of our pack are just as important as the rest. She was right, we both knew it. Neither of us wanted to leave Maddox. It simply felt wrong, but the safety of this pack mattered more than our personal happiness. Grandma arrived shortly after Maddox had left, a sour expression on her face. Her face was creased with lines, her eyes clouded with sleep. Grandma had definitely seen better days. I had expected her to return home weeks ago, I was sure she missed her little cottage in the woods and her herb garden. Not only did she stay for Dad, she stayed for Sean and I. With our mom gone, our family had a gaping hole that no one could fill. Grandma never tried to fill that hole, but she filled the house with life and laughter. She refused to let Dad and Sean sit around moping. Mom wouldn't want that, and Grandma knew it. You look like you need a couple days worth of sleep. I chuckled lightly giving her a quick hug before heading into the coffee shop. I think this entire pack needs a couple days' worth of sleep. Grandma replied. Despite the exhaustion in her eyes, she smiled, looking years younger. War takes its toll on everyone, warriors and civilians alike. It does, doesn't it? I sighed, I heard you've been volunteering at the community center. Someone has to feed all the soldiers. Grandma shrugged, they deserve some quality food, not that gruel Kate was serving. Kate was just another member of the pack, a few years younger than Grandma, with four children of her own. Volunteers had stepped up left and right, offering their homes, food and time to help out the pack. I'm sure they're very appreciative. I smiled softly. I ordered myself an iced mocha latte and one of their huge chocolate chip muffins. The last time I had been here I was with Brianna, how things have changed. Grandma and I sat at one of the small circular tables in the coffee shop, and I watched as something shifted in her eyes. How's life as the Luna treating you? She asked, when this mess is over, are you going to go through with the ceremony? The ceremony and event I had completely forgotten about. It wasn't that I questioned the decision to step up as Maddox's Luna, but there were more pressing things on my mind. The ceremony was a day of joy for the entire pack, where their Luna would step up and claim her position. It was a simple matter, the Alpha and Luna would draw a shallow cut along their palm and join hands. All of those voices everyone in the pack would then be linked to me. The ceremony was binding, allowing me to mind-link everyone in the pack simultaneously, as Maddox had done many times. Mates could naturally mind-link with each other, just as any individual in the pack could mind-link Maddox. The ceremony often happened months after the Alpha met his mate, giving the she-wolf time to decide if she truly wanted to become Luna. I had no such qualms, I was more than ready to step into the position. Of course, I will. I nodded, as much as I'd like to get it done with now, the last thing we need is an invasion during the celebration. I agree. Grandma nodded, 
giving me a long look. My granddaughter, Aluna. Not that I'm surprised, I always knew you were destined for great things. You're already willing to give everything for this pack, you've been its Luna for quite some time already. Something was bothering her, I could easily tell. I knew she hadn't a clue about Brianna and Giovanni's disappearance, but Grandma easily picked up on the moods and expressions of others. She could tell I was stressed, and that there was something I wasn't telling her. The only people who knew about Brianna and Giovanni's disappearance was his beta, Zeke, and Brianna's parents. They hadn't taken the news lightly, but they trusted Maddox to bring their daughter back. If only they knew that their trust wasn't in Maddox, but in me. The thought made my stomach turn. The last thing I wanted was to destroy their trust, to fail in returning their daughter. Even if we managed to get the upper hand and win this war, there were still other pressing concerns. How would the pack react to Giovanni's presence? He couldn't remain in the dark forever. Alpha Bran would undoubtedly refuse, which could lead to another problem entirely. Alpha Bran could easily decide to retaliate, which would lead to yet another war. The what-ifs and potential problems made my head swim but the caffeine and sugar did what it could to quiet my frazzled mind. Grandma and I stayed at the coffee shop for another half hour before she had to go back to the community center. It was nearing dinner time, Grandma and the other volunteers had to make food for all of the warriors who had come to this pack. As we stepped outside of the coffee shop, we nearly ran into Chelsea. I hadn't seen her since her birthday, not that I actively sought her out to begin with. She had Ethan at her side, an odd pairing considering neither really ever liked one another. Ethan had seen better days, dark rings lined his eyes, and they shined with a dull haunted light. Isaac had been a close friend of his, and had lost his life when Brittany managed to escape Maddox's dungeon. Chelsea had never cared for Isaac making it even stranger that she stood by Ethan's side. Chelsea's face turned up in a sneer as we locked eyes, while Ethan remained indifferent. Ethan was on all accounts, but he had never pretended to like me. When I dated Tyler, Chelsea was my closest friend. She was also the first to turn on me once I discovered Tyler wasn't my mate. Looks like everything finally worked out for you, Lola. Chelsea sneered, and through the jealousy burning in her eyes, I could see her insecurities shining clear. You've got your claws in yet another alpha, maybe this one will actually stick around. For once, Chelsea's words had no effect on me. I had a long list of things to worry about, and petty jealousy wasn't one of them. Chelsea had always known how to provoke a reaction from me, but this time, her words fell short. I had every intention on turning away when Grandma opened her mouth and spoke. Child, you need to learn some manners and learn how to speak to your future Luna. Grandma snapped. A smart person would hear the contained anger in her words and back off, Chelsea was not one of those people. Grandma had always known how to strike fear into Sean and I. Even Dad kept his distance when Grandma was truly angry. She emitted a calm and wise aura that surrounded her, and could easily make anyone sound childish and inexperienced. She looked down on Chelsea like a toddler throwing a fit, blatant disappointment burned in her eyes. She's not my Luna. Chelsea sneered, though it wasn't fueled with as much anger this time around. She crossed her arms over her chest and glared at my grandma, who seemed completely disinterested. Ethan stood to the side, his eyes flitting around the outside of the coffee shop. I wasn't even sure he heard what Chelsea had said. I was never close with Isaac, nor had I ever pretended to be, but I felt sorry for Ethan. Even though he had lost someone important. So long as you live in this pack. Lola is your Luna. Grandma's voice held an eerie calmness, one that told me Chelsea better back off if she had any sense of self-preservation. How shameful, 
Alpha Maddox will hear of this. He will not take kindly to you disrespecting his mate. Chelsea paled, most likely recalling the horrible rumors that surrounded Maddox. Rumors where he KD brutally and without mercy, rumors where he'd take prisoners for the slightest infractions and never let them see the light of day. Little did Chelsea know, most of the rumors were true, but they only told half of the story. Maddox was brutal, dominate, and fought with a ferocity that made most men pale in comparison. He was also selfless, brave, and would do anything and everything for his people. Every act of brutality, every cruel action had been for the benefit and safety of his pack. When he had taken this pack from Tyler and merged it with his own, it had taken a full month before the people of this pack saw him for what he was, everything that an alpha should be. Ethan I called out before Chelsea could storm away with a huff. Ethan's wandering eyes met my own, strained with grief. I'm sorry about Isaac. The people who hurt him will pay, you have my word. Thanks, Luna. Ethan nodded, his voice rougher than usual. Ethan headed into the coffee shop, leaving Chelsea staggering to catch up. Grandma flashed me a humorous smile though her eyes shined with both anger and sadness. That girl will learn some manners sooner or later. She's going to say the wrong thing to the wrong person someday. Grandma huffed, you handled that well, Lola. I wish I could have said the same about myself. She needed to hear what you said. I shrugged, you're right, someday she will say the wrong thing to someone. It nearly KD me to turn away from my grandma, to let her get into the car and watch as she drove away. There would be no long goodbyes. My family would only try to stop me. They wouldn't understand that I had no choice, that it was so much more than my life for Brianna's. I swallowed the guilt and tinge of fear that swirled in my stomach, mustering the courage to move forward. I headed towards the forest line just at the end of the road. I needed to be far from the pack's territory. From there, I would call the shadows and have them send the Vampire King my location. It was all downhill from there. Have you left yet? Maddox's voice flooded through my mind, rough and somewhat raspy. I'm about five minutes away from calling this entire thing off and dragging you back home. You wouldn't do that. I chuckled softly savoring the sound of his voice. I'm heading into the woods now. I'll be off our territory within an hour. I wish there was another way. Maddox replied, and I could almost see the grimace that tugged at his face. I know, but Brianna would do the same for me. I smiled, his voice filling me with a small sliver of peace. When I get back, we're going to have a lot of time to make up. You don't have to remind me, I know what I'll be missing. Maddox chuckled, though it was dry and somewhat forced. Remember, you need to be back here before your heat begins. I know. I nodded, stepping over rocks and pushing back branches as I continued walking through the forest. Two weeks maximum. Let's make it one. Maddox countered. I'll be waiting for your voice the entire time. One last thing, if that vampire tries to put his hands on you, KL him. As much as I want to do it myself, I'd rather have him DD sooner than later. Only my mark should be on your body. Oh, I plan on it. I chuckled, he won't get his hands on me, I promise. Maddox sent an alert to the patrol team on this side of the forest, telling them to steer clear so that I might pass. He hadn't given them a reason, nor had they asked for one. I walked through the territory line without a wolf in sight. I could have shifted, it would have made the hike a lot faster, but I wanted to prolong this. I wanted to prolong my freedom. Within the next hour or two, I would officially be a prisoner. I was nearly positive that my father would keep me around until I changed my mind, or use a full-blooded vampire to try and mess with my mind. 
I remembered what Grandma had taught me, and developed my own methods on shielding my mind. The Vampire King could try, but I would never condone the deaths of my people. I walked for two hours before stopping. I had been far enough away thirty minutes ago, but wanted to make sure the vampires wouldn't be anywhere near this pack. Birds chittered in the trees, leaves rustled as squirrels darted away from my presence. The forest was teeming with life, and despite the situation, it was beautiful. The sunlight shone through the trees, making the emerald leaves look delicate and transparent. As much as I hated to interrupt the peace in this forest, I had things that needed to be done. I closed my eyes and called out with my mind, calling to the shadows that lurked in every corner and crevice. A tugging sensation formed in my gut, and I winced as the forest around me grew quiet. The birds were no longer chirping the leaves were no longer crunching under the small feet of squirrels. The air around me grew uncomfortably cold, a chill settled in my bones and crept up my spine. I opened my eyes to see the forest had darkened, the sunlight no longer streamed through the treetops. Shadows slithered from every dark corner, some large tufts of darkness, others small and leech-like. They glided to a stop at my feet circling my body and waiting like patient pets. Larger shadows lingered at the edge of the forest line, and I could feel them watching me with burning intensity. I could feel their barely contained anticipation. They liked me as much as shadows could like a person. They liked that I made deals with them, that I fed them my blood. I had only tasted blood twice in my life, but each time had been quite the experience. The initial thought of drinking blood made me want to retch, but the taste the strength it brought on was unlike anything I had experienced. Don't get me wrong, I had no plans on going around biting humans, but I couldn't deny a part of me relished in the taste and strength. What is it you need, princess? They hissed in unison, their slippery voices circling my head and running down my skin in cold waves. I pulled out a small pocket knife from the pouch in my leggings. Maddox had given this to me when I told him of my plan, and assured me there was no silver within the blade. It was small and unassuming, and would do little damage if I actually stabbed someone with it. I flicked it open and watched what little sunlight was left catch the bright metal of the blade. The point was deviously sharp, begging to break through skin. I placed the pocket knife against my palm, gritting my teeth as I dragged it across my flesh. A hiss of pain escaped my clenched teeth, reminding me of how the shadows often sounded. Blood pooled in my hand, hot against my icy skin. The shadows slithered around my feet, their anticipation building with each drop of blood that splattered onto the earth. I need you to send my location to the Vampire King along with a message. Tell us. They hissed, slithering around my feet excitedly, what is the message? I gathered the blood in my hands, throwing it into the air and watching as it rained down on the shadows at my feet. They swarmed on the blood, and I watched in silence as they cleaned it from the earth. I'm here. Come and get me. Chapter 90 each passing minute gave me more time to think, a curse in and of itself. The more time I had to think, the more I wondered if there was a way out of this mess, a way Brianna and Giovanni could return safely. I was risking so much on the hopes that my father would actually let Brianna and Giovanni go. Brianna was useless to him once he had me in his clutches, but it was Giovanni I worried about. Giovanni had betrayed his king and any proud leader would want retribution. There was a large chance the Vampire King had no intention of letting Giovanni go, and I knew Brianna would refuse to leave without him. I needed a plan in case that happened. One hour and thirty-four minutes is how long it took to hear the quiet crunching of leaves beneath the heavy feet of the Vampire King's men. I knew the men coming to take me were Luna Freya's men, as no vampire would survive a blast of direct sunlight. The footsteps continued for the next ten minutes, 
growing louder with each passing second. I remained still, letting my senses drift to where the Luna Freya's men walked. I could make out at least six or seven sets of feet, possibly more. A sickening sense of fear settled in my stomach when the heavy footfalls stopped completely, and the forest was once again enveloped in silence. A stinging pain erupted from my neck, like a sharp bee sting. My hand flew up to the source, plucking a small dart from my skin. The needle was a few inches long, a clear substance dripping from the tip. The forest around me blurred into bright shades of green and brown. I could no longer hear anything other than my panting breaths. The pain spread into my body, seeping into my bloodstream. The world around me tilted as my vision tunneled, and I found myself looking up from the forest floor. My legs had collapsed from under me, yet I felt nothing. The sky was a bright shade of baby blue, round tufts of clouds drifted by slowly. The world around me faded the bright colors leached from my vision until darkness swallowed me whole. I woke to the sound of voices, though I couldn't make out who they were coming from. The main person talking had a rough voice, one I hadn't heard before. I could hear gravel crunching and my body jostling as we drove down some road. My vision was obscured, cloaked by a dark mesh that had been placed over my head. My entire body ached my muscles groaning as I fought to remain still. I focused on my breathing, keeping it even and relaxed. Judging from the aching pain in my body, they had used wolf's pain. A dart that size should have been enough to render me unconscious for a few days, but for some reason I had woken up early. Maya was still down for the count, unconscious in my mind, but I was becoming more lucid with each passing second. It must have had something to do with not being a full werewolf. That was the only explanation I could think of as to why the wolf's bane hadn't worked to its full capacity. I strained my eyes, trying to peer through the thin fabric that was placed over my head. It was clear they expected me to still be asleep, as the fabric wasn't as thick as it could have been. It was still daytime, that much I could tell. I could make out blurred shades of green as we passed of trees. My hands were bound at the front, and judging from the slight stinging pain, the cuffs had small bits of silver embedded within. Not enough to cause excruciating pain, but enough to keep me bound and in human form. The silver and wolf's bane kept me from mind-linking Maddox, not that I had any useful information at the moment, but it would have been nice to hear his voice. I was smushed between two large forms, both radiating an intense heat. My head was relaxed against one of the men's shoulders, who sat still as I slept against him. From what limited hearing I had, there were four men in the vehicle. Two smushed against me, one in the passenger seat, and one driving. Tristan has the room ready. She should be out for the rest of the day. I wondered if they were going to throw me in a cell, much like the one they probably put Brianna and Giovanni into. I wasn't expecting hospitality and kindness, I knew exactly what I was walking into. Would my father actively try and sway me to his side? Or would he use my friends against me, forcing my hand? If Maya were awake, I could have tapped into her senses, heightening my own. As it stood, I was on my own for the time being. I strained my eyes harder, ignoring the prickling headache that formed across my temples. We were driving down a narrow two-lane road, there were no other cars passing us by. I could make out a large parking lot at the far end of the road, and what looked like a vehicle's parked inside. I used my minutes wisely. The closer we got, the more details I could make out. As we pulled into the parking lot, I noticed the large building that stood at the edge. It had to be a warehouse, as it was larger than any house I had ever seen, and looked run down on the outside. My eyes snapped over to the entrance of the parking lot, where a small sign said Macy's Warehouse. It wasn't enough information yet, 
but it was definitely a start. The white walls of the building were stained with dirt and what looked like mold. I could just make out a bunch of wide bays for semi-trucks to park and make deliveries. I had expected something more extravagant, certainly not an abandoned warehouse in the middle of nowhere. The car lurched to a stop, and I could hear two of the doors open and slam shut. The man on my left side got out of the vehicle, closing the door behind him. One of the men scooped me into his arms and headed towards a large set of double doors. The glass was tinted, making it impossible to peer inside. I should have known they would have remodeled this place. I couldn't imagine the mighty vampire king living in a mold and rat infested warehouse. As we stepped inside, safe from the sunlight, a familiar voice called out, one that nearly made me stiffen. I've got her. Tristan said to the men. Let him know I'm bringing her to her room. A large pair of hands grabbed my torso, pulling me from the car much more gently than I had expected. Tristan scooped me up, one of his arms around my back, the other underneath my legs. I kept my limbs loose, desperately trying to maintain the facade that I was unconscious. I let my head roll against his neck, grimacing under the thin fabric as his scent registered in my nose. It was nothing like Maddox's rich and intoxicating scent, the smell of nature and male musk. Tristan's scent was lighter, with just a hint of sweetness that let me know he was in fact a vampire. As I remained still in Tristan's arms, I made sure my mental blocks were in place. Grandma had told me to picture a library, but that technique hadn't worked so well for me. Instead of a library, I pictured a thick wall of steel blocking my mind from anyone who might want to intrude. As Tristan held me close to his chest, I could feel him slithering into my mind and greeting the thick wall with a frown. I nearly shivered as his fingers grazed down the metal, asking for entrance. My wall remained intact, and I continued scanning the inside of the warehouse. I wasn't sure what I had been expecting, but this wasn't it. The inside of the warehouse had been completely remodeled, false walls had been placed in an effort to make the building look more like a luxurious home. We stood in what was supposed to be the foyer, a thick Persian rug covered most of the floor. Tristan walked with purpose, giving me little time to scan the room around us. He gave a brief nod to one of the men standing in the room, and continued forward. We walked through another door one that lead to a living room and a flight of steps. Tristan moved fast, darting through the living room and up the stairs with ease. He walked down a thin hallway and unlocked one of the doors, stepping inside and shutting it behind us. I recognized the room, and knew I had come here when I visited Tristan through our one-sided bond. The walls were rough stone, the floor except for a black shag carpet. A thick fireplace sat at one end of the room, a bright fire crackling within. At the other end was a bed and an oak dresser. Another door sat at the far end of the room, hopefully a bathroom. My father had to have been remodeling this place for years. The inside was too luxurious to have been done in the last few months. Tristan sat me down on the large bed that sat at the other end of the room. The comforter felt like silk against my skin, red in color. It seemed the color red was an occurring theme in this place, a sad irony. I resisted the urge to rub at my wrists as he removed the cuffs from my hands. I could see his form through the fabric. He had stopped at the edge of the bed and was looking down on me, but I couldn't make out the expression on his face, only his large form and blonde hair. You can stop pretending now, Lola. Tristan's voice called out, soft and somewhat grim. Every instinct in my body was telling me to chuck the nearest heavy object at his head and make a run for it. I was in enemy territory, and even with my uh, unconscious, I already wanted out. This place wasn't my home, it was more than anything else. My home was with Maddox with the pack he selflessly ran. My home was my grandma, Sean, and dad my real dad. 
As much as I already wanted out of this place, I was here for more than just Brianna and Giovanni. We have more pressing matters at hand, Lola. Tristan grunted. His footsteps grew louder as he approached. I felt his fingers wrap around the thin fabric they had placed over my head. I gave him my best murderous glare as he yanked the bag from my head, his eyes both flickering with amusement and irritation. I brushed the hair from my face, pulling myself into a sitting position on the bed as I glared daggers at Tristan. My wrists were red and sore with what looked like rub. I knew the irritation was from the silver, but the cuffs didn't have enough to actually sear my skin. I could feel my uster in the back of my mind, but knew she wouldn't be awake for a couple hours now. The lingering pain in my body told me it was still working to get the wolf spain out of my system. There would be no shifting or contacting Maddox for the next few hours. There you go, beautiful. Tristan nodded, his face looked as though it were chiseled from stone, scarred with severity. How do you know? I asked, surprised at how stubborn and strong my voice sounded. I've long learned not to underestimate you. Tristan snorted, crossing his arms over his chest. Also, you snore when you sleep. I don't snore. I snapped, and stop creeping on me while I'm sleeping. You're not the only one who knows how to tug the bond. Tristan shrugged, a half-hearted smirk twitched onto his lips. Besides, if I remember correctly, you visited me first. You left the door open, I simply stepped through. Next time I'll make sure the door's shut, and locked. My voice came out sarcastically sweet. You couldn't just leave well enough alone, could you? You had to come running to save your friends. Tristan shook his head, pinching the bridge of his nose. It seemed someone was in a sour mood today. I expected Tristan to practically dance with joy, rubbing my surrender in my face as he tried to weasel his way into my heart or pants. Instead of looking smug or joyful, Tristan looked irritated. His blonde hair was pulled behind his head, the top half pulled back in a ponytail while the bottom half was draped over his broad shoulders. This time he wasn't dressed to impress, but was wearing a casual t-shirt and a pair of loose jeans. I couldn't leave them behind. I replied, she's my best friend. And what about Giovanni? Tristan asked, his eyes narrowing. How quick you are to accept him, knowing what side he was once on. People can change, Tristan. I snapped, he's her mate, and he chose her. I'm willing to trust Brianna's judgment. I hope you have a plan in place, Lola. Tristan's voice was like ice, though something else flickered in the depths of his crystal eyes. Now that he has you, he will never let you go. I can handle it. I replied straining to keep my voice calm and confident. Can you? Tristan asked, a single blonde eyebrow lifting in disbelief. I noticed a brief flash of pain in his eyes, though he quickly covered it up. If you can truly handle it, answer a question for me. Why is the Alpha's mark on your skin? Why can I smell him on you? He's my mate. I grimaced that answers all of your questions. If your father sees his mark on your skin, if he smells his scent on you, he will KL you both. Tristan hissed lowly, it was a stupid mistake, Lola. What am I supposed to do? I snapped. I let him mark me because he's my mate. I slept with him because I love him. I can't just remove his mark and even if I could, I won't. Low blow, my conscience told me. A felt a sharp stab of guilt as Tristan's eyes darkened, freezing over. His voice felt like shards of ice piercing my skin, making small beads of blood form along my body. You don't need to remove it, just conceal it. Tristan's voice had dropped exceedingly low, ask the shadows to hide the mark and cover your scent. 
And what about the men that brought me here? I asked, my voice losing some of its previous venom. I sat in a car with them for who knows how long. They've already noticed my scent. I took care of that the moment you arrived. Tristan grunted, averting his eyes from my face and over to the crackling fire that warmed the room. You went inside their minds. I asked, surprise staining my voice. Your mind games don't work on full-blooded werewolves. Luckily, most of the deceased Luna's men are half-breeds. Tristan replied, his eyes running over my face as he said the word deceased. Tristan had gone inside of their minds, wiping the memory of my scent from existence. He had done that for me, to keep me alive. The somewhat selfless action surprised me, but that didn't mean I was willing and ready to jump in bed with the man. Somehow Tristan knew Luna Freya had died at my hands. I wondered if Brittany was here, living somewhere in this warehouse. It was a hopeful thought. I could KL two birds with one stone, rescue Brianna and Giovanni, and KL Brittany. Don't flatter yourself, I did it for completely selfish reasons. Tristan grimaced, but I could see the lie burning away in his eyes, brighter than the fire that crackled in the room. Go on, call on the shadows. I'm not willing to pay their prices. I shook my head, they ask for too much. That's because you let them ask for too much. Tristan sighed, you know so little about what you can do. It's a surprise you made it this far. Gee, thanks. I rolled my eyes, how do I keep them from asking for too much? More often than not, they'll do favors for just a taste of some blood. Tristan shrugged, it's the bigger favors that require unique and often unpleasant payment. Even Tristan knew more about the shadows than I did, the thought was somewhat discouraging. I had no doubt that my father could teach me so much, but I wasn't willing to betray my entire pack for the information. I would rather remain in the dark and save the people I love than trade thousands of lives for power. Do you have a knife? I asked, my voice hard with determination. I would make it through this, I told myself. I would make sure Brianna and Giovanni were safe, I would give Maddox information that changed the outcome of this war, and I would come home to him. You're going to feed them your blood? Tristan asked, his face contorting with surprise. I've done it before. I shrugged, grimacing at the strange look on his face. They don't seem to mind. Well of course they wouldn't. Tristan scoffed. You're half vampire, half werewolf. Not only that, you're a part of the Kuritis bloodline and heir to the throne. Your blood is of the highest standard. The vampire king would lose his mind if he heard you fed the shadows your blood. It's not like I have an endless line of willing victims. I rolled my eyes, already catching a glimpse at the kind of person my father was. Use my blood. Tristan replied, pulling a small silver blade from his pocket, pressing it into my hands gently. Confusion twisted in my gut at the gentle expression on his face. I was far from ever trusting Tristan with anything, but I wondered what game he was playing. Did he think the werewolves were going to win? Was that why he was suddenly kissing up to me? He hadn't tried to force himself on me yet, a positive sign. Not only did he go through the minds of Luna Freya's men, he was willing to use his blood to call the shadows, to keep me safe from my father. I pushed those conflicting thoughts aside and steadied myself. I closed my eyes, reaching with my mind into the deepest corners of the room. Calling the shadows was effortless now, as they responded to my calls with barely contained glee. When I opened my eyes, the room had darkened the thick shadows against the wall pulsing. The icy coldness washed over me, though this time my body seemed to handle it better. I was becoming used to calling the shadows, the thought both excited and worried me. 
The shadows pulsed and slithered from the darkest corners of the room, gliding across the floor to pool at my feet. Larger shadows remained behind, watching me with silent interest. I had their undivided attention, and was both thrilled and intimidated by that fact. They're almost excited to see you. Tristan scoffed, shaking his head. Do not mistake their excitement for fondness. They enjoy your blood, your power. I know. I replied, my voice strong. I know what they are. They're not pets. No, they are not. Tristan agreed, giving the shadows a wary glance. They are much more obedient to you, it seems. I stood from the bed and walked over to Tristan. His eyes were guarded as the shadows followed closely behind, pooling around us in a sea of ebony. He placed his hand in my own, his crystal eyes smoldering as I pressed the blade against his palm. Ignoring the intense look in his eyes, and thinking only of Maddox, I called out to the shadows. Be stern with them. Tristan murmured. I need a favor. I told them, I need you to conceal the cobalt mark on my skin, and hide Maddox's scent from my body. Do not remove the mark, just conceal it. I expect it back once I leave this place. What will you pay, princess? They hissed with their silky voices, the blood of a pure-blood vampire. Yes. I nodded, you can have some of his blood. We enjoy your blood, princess. They whispered, pooling around my legs, stretching out like cats. Ancient blood, powerful blood. It is mine to give as I see fit. I told them, I told you what I offer, do you accept? Yes, princess. They whispered, their voices caressing my skin like shards of ice. For you, yes. Tristan gave me a firm nod, and I pressed the blade hard against his hand. I might have been harder than needed, but I couldn't force myself to feel guilty. Blood pooled in his cupped hands, a blazing shade of scarlet. The scent swirled around me, rich and potent. Melted chocolate and blood oranges, liquid nectar. The vampire side of me practically watered at the mouth, but I pushed it aside with ease. Drink. I told them, and watched as Tristan let the blood splash to the floor. His blood splattered across the floor, tiny crimson drops flying in every direction. The shadows devoured the blood feverishly, leaving the floor spotless. I pulled the hem of my t-shirt aside, looking down at Maddox's cobalt mark. I ran my fingers along it, remembering how it felt as his teeth sunk into my skin. I remembered the ecstasy that coursed through me when his lips grazed the mark, the way my name sounded when it left his lips. I watched in sheltered sadness as the cobalt mark faded from my skin, the lingering scent of Maddox vanishing from my body. Not gone just concealed. Chapter 91 Three days, or possibly four I wasn't entirely sure, but the monotony of being locked in this room was slowly eating away at me. The silver cuff on my wrist kept me from mind-linking Maddox, and kept Maya at bay. My skin under the cuff was sore, red, and irritated as though I had a rash. My days and nights began to switch. SG with my already questionable sleeping pattern not that I expected much sleep when my father was somewhere lurking about. Tristan came to the door once every couple of hours, a tray of food and a small cup of blood in his hands. He needn't worry that I might run, as I was already too weak from the constant contact with Silver. I was practically human, making Tristan and the rest of the vampires much stronger than me. It was blatantly obvious the vampires weren't used to human or half-human guests, as the food was horribly lacking. Gelatinous oatmeal and often small packs of crackers or cookies. I wasn't ashamed to say I downed the cup of blood he had given me at each meal, though it worried me where it might have come from. Each day I'd ask Tristan when the vampire king would finally see me, 
when would Brianna and Giovanni be released each time he said soon, annoyingly cryptic. It gave me more than enough time to think over Tristan's sudden loyalty switch. He had told me once that he had his own plans, that he never wished for the werewolf species to be eradicated. Does that mean I suddenly trusted him? Not at all, but I needed whatever allies I could find. I leapt from the bed as I heard footsteps echo down the hallway, followed by the thick wooden door to my bedroom holding cell open. Tristan stood in the doorway, this time without a tray in his hands. He stepped into the room and closed the door behind him. When he finally spoke, his voice was low and hushed. My stomach was in knots as I followed him down the hallway, towards the back of the warehouse. Tristan was silent the entire time, his shoulders tense at what was to come. We stopped in front of a thick set of double doors, the wood smooth and flawless to the touch. Two vampires stood on either side of the door, their dark eyes never once straying from where they stared. My eyes bounced around the room as the doors swung open, revealing a room I had once been to. It was the room I visited when my father used the shadows to call me to him. A large maroon sectional was set in front of a large fireplace, a thick Persian rug under our feet. A small bar carried decanters of suspicious-looking scarlet liquid. Sitting on the sectional, with one of his arms draped over the back, was my father the Vampire King. I had seen my father once before, but this time was different. I hadn't seen him in person, not truly. The aura that surrounded him was dark and suffocating, like walking into a sauna. My lungs struggled to breathe in the thick air, and my heart rate skyrocketed. The mop of styled raven hair on his head was identical to my own, right down to his bright eyes, which stared into the flames roaring in the fireplace. I was hyper-aware at how the shadows in the room slithered, hiding in the darkness as they surrounded us. I could taste their excitement, their interest in what was about to happen. Sit, Lola. My father all but commanded, never once turning to look me in the eye. Tristan stood off to the side, leaning against the fireplace mantel as I trailed over to the couch. I sat as far away from my father as I could get, holding my ground as he turned and looked into my eyes. I always thought his eyes would be empty, lacking any hint of a soul. I was wrong, his eyes weren't empty. They were filled with a burning hunger that would bring the world to its knees, an anger that consumed every sliver of compassion or conscience. Looking into my father's eyes taught me something, evil doesn't just pop into existence evil is born, bred, and taught. I tried to imagine my father as a child, eyes full of wonder and happiness. I didn't bother looking for any sliver of good within him, as I knew it had all been smothered by that vicious fire burning in his eyes, but he had not been born evil. Life warped him, changed him into this monster and not once had he resisted. I could see my features reflected in his own. The dark hair, full lips, and round eyes. Looking at my father's face made me realize how little I had gotten from my mom, and I wondered how she stomached raising me. How could she look into my eyes for all those years and not see the evil, twisted mate she had once given into? Do you understand why I need you here, Lola? He asked, those luminous eyes staring at me, slicing away the layers until he reached my soul. I resisted the urge to fidget, to shift uncomfortably under his stare. Everything about him was intense, frighteningly so. I knew without a doubt that with my help, he would achieve his goal. He would never rest until the werewolves were all but eradicated, and the humans lined up for the slaughter. You need a queen. I repeated the words that plagued my mind for months now. Tristan watched the two of us carefully, his eyes never lingering on the vampire king for too long. My father scoffed, though the action lacked emotion. He looked me over for a minute, running his eyes down my hair, my face with his speculatory gaze. I was sure he saw what I did, 
himself reflected in my face. Why would I need a queen I cannot trust, one I cannot control? My father asked, one of his dark eyebrows lifting as he stared at me. I had the feeling his question was rhetorical, so I kept my mouth shut. What do you know about witches, Lola? The question caught me off guard, and I racked my brain for every last detail I remembered. Grandma had taught me the history of witches, though not much was known anymore. Most of the information had faded into obscurity, or had been buried over the centuries. Not much. I admitted, there used to be a lot of witches, but many lines died off or went into hiding. Do you know why they went into hiding? My father pressed, and seemed to be amused at my lack of knowledge. No, I don't. I replied. My grandfather had a plan, one that would rid the world of our enemies. A plan that would ensure vampires were finally able to step into the light. My father continued, vampires have been at the bottom of the food chain for too long, letting the humans think they actually held some semblance of power. My grandfather hunted the witches into near extinction, all whilst remaining under the noses of werewolves. What does this have to do with me? I asked, fighting to take the edge out of my voice. Before leaving the room, Tristan had warned me not to speak out against my father, that he was cruel and vengeful when need be. It has everything to do with you. My father's smile was oily and serpent-like. Let me tell you a story, then you might understand your purpose. Many years ago, the shadows guided me to a woman, one who would be my ideal mate. She was a werewolf, and lived in a small pack with her family. The moment we locked eyes, she was under the thrall of the mate bond. I spent countless weeks with her, until she allowed me to mark her, and I let her do the same. I told her of my plans, and while she was conflicted, she remained by my side. My father began, and I knew he was talking about my mother. I wanted to stop him, to deny that she would have ever had a part in his plans, but Tristan's firm look stopped me in my tracks. I told her of the child we would have, and her importance in this world. The child would be of three different species, and would wield power the world has not yet seen. She would be the product of a werewolf and a vampire, but hold power bestowed to her from generations of witches. The young, mated werewolf was horrified when she learned the truth, that she would sire a monster unlike any other into this world. She fled, but couldn't remain hidden forever. I found her again, and when I did, I used the mate bond she coveted against her. You were the product of that, Lola. My heart constricted as I replayed his words over and over again, each time refusing to come to terms. It wasn't possible, it couldn't be. My mom would never join his side, would never abandon her people. My stomach rolled, and I clenched my fists as I fought the urge to hurl all over the expensive Persian rug on the floor. He had used the mate bond against her to conceive me, that much I expected. What I couldn't understand was how he thought that child was me. Witches were all but extinct, and I had never seen one in real life before. My mom was not a witch, that much I knew, nor had I ever exhibited any signs of strange power. My mouth flopped open, and I said the first thing that came to mind. My mom wasn't a witch. I shook my head, you're wrong. I'm not that child. Something you'll learn, I am rarely ever wrong. My father smiled grimly, the shadow of the crackling fire wavered against his alabaster skin. My mother was the last in a long and ancient line of witches. She was half vampire, and had been sought out by my father for a very specific purpose. The magic in her bloodline skipped a generation, and only seemed to show in the women of her family. The magic of my mother's bloodline skipped her generation, falling onto you. I wanted to cover my ears, to ignore everything he was telling me like a child would. 
Tristan's firm gaze was the only thing keeping me sane, reminding me to remain calm, to remain respectful. My father wasn't above hurting me, nor would our family relations keep him from throwing me in a cell next to Brianna and Giovanni. Now, I want you to listen closely, Lola. My father spoke clearly, enunciating each word so that I might commit them to memory. Do not overthink your purpose here. You will comply to my terms, or be eradicated with the rest of the werewolves. I won't for one second believe you have suddenly changed sides. As my firstborn, you hold the most power. Firstborn. I repeated, feeling my gut twist at his blatant threat. My mom never had another child. She hadn't, not with the Vampire King. I was sure he knew about Sean, but I refused to speak his name, to give the Vampire King another person to use against me. My father's lips twitched, pulling up in that dry, serpentine smile he favored. You are not the only one to make deals with the shadows, Lola. My father replied, lifting his hand to wave at Tristan. You would be amazed at what they can do, if one is simply willing to pay the price. I watched as Tristan left the room, returning a moment later with someone in tow. Every muscle in my body stiffened, every joint locked as I looked into the eyes of a girl no older than eighteen. My hair, my father's hair sat on her head in long, raven-colored waves. Her face was soft and round like my own, her cheekbones high and lashes long. The only difference were our eyes. I had gotten my eyes from our father, where the girl must have gotten them from her mother whoever that might be. How? The word left my lips in a ragged whisper. I couldn't force my eyes from the girl. She gazed at me with the same curiosity, though hers was laced with caution and suspicion. My eyes darted over to Tristan, silently pleading with him to tell me this was some elaborate lie. From the hardness in his eyes, I knew my father had not told me a single lie since arriving that everything he said had been the truth. Two years after your birth, I tried relentlessly to regain you and your mother, but the man she chose as a mate had a witch for a mother. My father laughed dryly, his eyes burning with that uncontained, murderous light. The woman possessed little power, but was able to keep your mother and you safe. I racked my mind, lingering over each word until I finally understood. Grandma, my dad's mom. She had always seemed to know when something was happening, when someone was hiding something from her. Her little cottage came to mind, the old and dusty books she kept littered on shelves, and the sprawling herb garden she had out back. Grandma was a witch, a part of a breed that was thought to have died off many years ago. I wanted to be surprised, but I found this information the least surprising of the bunch. I needed an alternative, in case you proved to be unreliable. He sneered, I called on the shadows, who were happy to do my bidding. They offered me the chance at another child. Not as powerful as a firstborn but not without potential. All I needed was a powerful witch to sire this child. I found one in Krajava, Romania. A blood witch who had grown tired of hiding, who had grown comfortable in her habits. She didn't have the gift of foresight like her mother, and never saw my men coming. My stomach rolled again, and I pressed a hand to my throat as the urge to hurl increased. He had sought out a witch and forced her to carry his child. My brain refused to process the thought, to accept that someone was capable of such a vulgar action. I knew without asking that his request had come at a steep price, but couldn't hold myself back as I asked. What did you pay? I asked, my voice weak. As you've already figured out, the higher the request, the steeper the price. He smiled grimly. I paid ten years of my life. After the witch was with child, I fell asleep for the next ten years. In that time, the witch used what remaining power she had and escaped my men. Ten years later, 
I sought out the child she had stolen from me. I perfected my plans, gathered my recourses until I could finally come for you. You know why I'm here. I stammered, forcing the words from my lips as I struggled not to think about what he had done to the poor witch. I'll do whatever you need, just let Brianna and Giovanni go. I am a man of my word. He nodded, despite the fact that Giovanni was one of my best men, I will let them go. I'm sure you wish to see proof of that before moving forward. I do, I want to know that they're still alive. I nodded, leaning forward in my seat. Very well, but I must take measures of my own to ensure your compliance. He replied, his eyes flashing with deadly intention. There is nothing stopping you from betraying me once your companions have been released. Tristan, you may proceed. My father nodded, his eyes never once straying from my own. I knew what was coming next, as Tristan had warned me before taking me to my father. I watched as Tristan stepped forward, and shuddered as he slid into my mind. I could feel him trail his fingers down the shield I had around my mind, the steel door that kept him barred from my innermost thoughts and feelings. The door shuddered and shook as I wrenched it open allowing Tristan access into my mind. Chapter 92 Tristan had told me what to expect when my father finally called. My father had a backup plan, one where he would not need me. It was in my best interest to prove useful to him, to show that I was willing to do anything for Brianna and Giovanni's freedom. I believed Tristan when he told me the only way my father would allow their freedom, was for Tristan to infiltrate my mind. My father did not know that I had long ago learned to shield myself. In those few minutes I had with Tristan, he taught me how to carve out a small piece of my mind for him. I would be able to keep my wits, my thoughts, and my self-control. The hardest part would be pretending that Tristan had control of my mind, that he was able to make me compliant. I had no time to practice, and unfortunately had to place my trust in Tristan. I wrenched open the door that blocked my innermost thoughts, carving out a small section for Tristan. After a dull headache began prickling along my forehead, I was confident Tristan could venture in my mind no further. My father sat silently, watching Tristan and I with an unwavering gaze. It's your turn. Tristan's voice echoed in my mind, play your part well or we'll all be doomed. I didn't have the time to mull over what my father had said, or the fact that my grandma had kept this from me. The sting of betrayal was brief, as I had more important things to focus on. My sister half-sister, stood at the other side of the room, her chestnut eyes on me, her lips parted with words that would not form. For a split second, I wondered what her life had been like. Our father was subdued for ten years, his payment for her creation. She must have lived a normal life until then, until he snatched her from her home in an attempt to turn her into a monster. It was a risk one I prayed would pay off, but I couldn't leave her behind. She had spent far more time with our father than I had, and I wondered how grievously she suffered. No matter what happened, I'd find a way to take her with us. I wiped the emotion from my face, and let the light fade from my eyes. I turned to face my father slowly, almost lethargically. I remembered how it felt to have Tristan in my head, how it almost felt like I was being drugged. I let my eyes glaze over as I gazed at my father, and waited until he finally spoke. Did she fight you? My father asked Tristan, his bright eyes interested and calculating. She did, my lord. Tristan nodded, the witch who helped raise her, tried to teach her how to shield her mind. Her shields are weak, I've broken through them before. Good. My father nodded, completely unaware that Tristan had betrayed him. I assume she would like to ensure her companion's safety. She would. Tristan nodded. Lead her to the dungeons. 
keep her under tight control. My father nodded, his eyes flickering back to the fire. When you release the traitor and his mate, make sure to blindfold them. I won't have our location getting back to the She-Wolf's pack. Regardless, they are on borrowed time. We'll let them have these next few days before we wipe them off the map. Yes, my lord. Tristan nodded, heading to the door. I stood from the couch slowly, keeping my posture relaxed and my gait slow. I remembered how it felt when Tristan entered my mind at the club, how all of the important details in my life faded into the background, how nothing truly mattered. If Tristan were truly in my mind, I wouldn't have any idea where I was, or who I had been talking to. I followed Tristan down the hall, keeping my glazed eyes ahead. I never once let my eyes stray to the guards, or the vampires that lingered the corridors and rooms. Tristan led me downstairs and towards the back of the warehouse, where a thick metal door sat in the concrete wall. He slid the door open, and I kept my gaze uninterested as the screech of metal filled the warehouse. We walked into what looked like an old maintenance closet. Brooms, mops, and shelves of cleaner sat along the walls. Towards the back of the room, a cement staircase descended into the floor. Flickering fluorescent lights lit the staircase, and I followed closely behind Tristan as we traveled down into the earth. The tunnel we turned into was not one made of earth, as the walls and floor were the same cement material as the rest of the warehouse. It was just another testament to how long the vampires had been living here, and how long they had spent remodeling the place. I fought the urge to squint as we turned down a hall where the fluorescent lights had begun to flicker and fade, trying my best not to stumble over my own feet. With Maya suppressed by the silver cuffs around my wrists, I had only my human senses to rely on. Even with those dulled senses, I could smell the odor of blood and human filth. I clenched my teeth together, fighting the urge to gag as we turned into a room full of cells. It was Brianna I noticed first. Her shoulder-length hair was sticking up in matted tufts, her makeup smeared down her cheeks. The clothes she had worn were caked with dirt. In the same cell, sat Giovanni. Dark circles sat under his eyes, his cheekbones more prominent, and his skin a sickly shade of white. I wondered if they had been feeding them down here, and if they had given Giovanni any blood. The flash of burning hunger in his eyes told me what I needed to know, that whatever they had been feeding him, it wasn't enough. I fought the urge to physically recoil as I realized why they had put Brianna and Giovanni in the same cell. It wasn't out of the kindness of their hearts. They knew Giovanni would be overwhelmed with hunger, and wanted to see if their mate bond could withstand his need for blood. From the looks of it, Giovanni hadn't fed from Brianna. As Brianna saw me, she leapt to the front of her cell, her hands wrapped around the silver bars. I could hear the stinging of her flesh as she gripped the metal, but her eyes burned with such a ferocious helplessness that I couldn't help but want to console her. Instead, I had to remain calm uninterested as my best friend pleaded with her eyes. Two guards stood at the end of the cell room, and another two were situated at the entrance. I kept my eyes away from the guards, letting them roam lazily. Lola. Brianna gasped, her voice rough and hoarse. Lola, what are you doing here? You can't be here, they're using you. They're using us to get to you. The hardest part of all of this was not looking Brianna in the eyes, pretending she didn't exist that she held no importance. I wanted to throw myself to the floor, to fight with every last breath until she was freed from her cell. I let my eyes pass over her face, glazed and uninterested. I'm afraid you're wasting your breath, she wolf. Tristan sighed, though he didn't look too unhappy over the fact. She can't hear you, not truly. Brianna turned her gaze on Tristan practically spitting fire as she snarled at him. Giovanni did not follow Brianna's gaze, 
his eyes were locked directly on me. You got inside her head. Brianna growled, another pathetic attempt to get into her pants, and get yourself a higher position. My position is secure, but do enjoy your freedom. Tristan sneered, while it lasts. Will he actually let them go? I called out in my mind, pinpointing Tristan's presence as it lingered in the space I had carved out for him. Yes. Despite everything else, he is a man of his word. Tristan grunted, they'll be unconscious and blindfolded, but he will release them. Good. I replied, my voice shaky. Tristan turned to leave, and I followed behind him. Just as we were leaving, I locked eyes with Giovanni. I tried to convey the words I needed to say through my eyes, and desperately hoped he would understand. I could tell from one look, Giovanni saw right through my rouse, and that he knew I was very aware of my surroundings. He moved his head, the smallest of movements, but I knew he understood. Only when Tristan brought me back to my room and shut the door behind us, did I let out a long breath. My shoulders sagged and for a moment, I felt a crushing weight lift from my shoulders. Giovanni knew, that could prove useful. Undoubtedly, Brianna would want to stay behind, to rescue me herself. Giovanni would be able to placate her, to convince her to return to Maddox. You sounded believable back there. I told Tristan, unease dancing around my stomach. I still couldn't figure Tristan out. I replayed the different scenarios and endings in my mind, never once discerning what angle Tristan was playing. He hadn't once attempted to take advantage of me during my stay here, though I wouldn't put anything past him. If anything, he was proving helpful. He had openly betrayed his king by not taking control of my mind, by having us pretend. For now, we had the upper hand. We all have our part to play, Lola. Tristan smiled grimly, I'm simply playing mine. And what part is that? I called out just as Tristan turned to leave. You're helping me by lying to my father. Whose side are you on? I'm on the side where neither of our species is eradicated. Tristan grimaced, as it stands, vampires have the upper hand. That's also why I'm here. I want to give my pack the upper hand. I countered, there's only one way to stop this war, and that's to KL my father. I could end all of this right now if I were able to get to him. KL him, in his own home. Tristan scoffed, you'll be DD before you get the chance. There's two ways you can go about this, use magic to end his life, or wait until you're on the battlefield. I don't know any magic, and I don't have the time to learn. I shook my head. There was no way I would be mentioning my upcoming heat to Tristan, but even without my heat, there was no chance my father would postpone his war plans so that I might teach myself magic. Then I assume you better come up with a plan. Tristan murmured, I'll be back tomorrow, try and get some rest until then. The door shut behind Tristan with a dull thud, leaving me to my looming thoughts. I already had a plan. Figure out when the vampires plan to AK, discern the location of this warehouse, and get the information back to Maddox. He could come up with a small team to help rescue me and my half-sister, while also preparing for the upcoming battle. I could only hope Maddox would have enough time to evacuate the town, assuming I learned of when my father planned to AK. After sleeping a total of two hours last night, I woke to the sound of my door opening. My heart stilled in my chest as my half-sister walked in. Even with sleep clouding my eyes, I loosened my posture and tried to appear oblivious to my surroundings. Her dark hair was shorter than mine, grazing her shoulders, but everything about her face looked familiar except for those dark eyes, brimming with silent intelligence. You don't have to pretend. She shook her head, her voice small and delicate. 
I know he's not in your mind. How did you know? I asked, my voice flat and tinged with suspicion. I just know. She shrugged, picking at her fingers as she watched me from across the room. Father says my powers should be manifesting, but I've never seen any proof of that. And did you tell him? I grimaced, did you tell him I was faking it? No, I didn't. Her tone was soft, her eyes guarded. She walked over to the side of my bed, cautious as though I might AK her. She perched herself on the edge, her spine ridged and straight. Her voice dipped into a low whisper, Are you planning to leave here? To escape. What would make you think that? I asked, fighting to keep my voice even. I came here of my own free will. Not that I would tell her, but I planned on taking her away from here as soon as I could. I didn't care if she were kicking and screaming, I would get her far away from our father. He would do nothing but turn her into a monster, and use her for his own gain. She had a life before this, before he swept in and took her. Take me with you. She whispered, get me out of this place. I can help. I know where all of the guards are stationed. Once father attacks your pack, the warehouse will be vulnerable. There will only be enough guards here to keep an eye on the two of us. Father is going to join the battle, he wants to KL the Alpha himself. I tried not to flinch at the thought of Maddox DG at the hands of my father, and tried even harder not to think of him. Every time I thought of Maddox, I felt this crippling pain in my chest. I didn't know it was possible to miss someone with every fiber of your being, to be willing to be and the world down just for a glimpse at them. Do you know when he's planning to AK? I whispered, another wave of unease settled in my stomach as I placed more trust than I wanted in this girl I had never met before. I don't. She frowned, he doesn't tell me things, he doesn't trust me. Any number of the vampires in here will know, the problem is getting them to tell you. She tilted her head towards the door, as though she heard something interesting and quickly stood from my bed. What's your name? I asked as she walked over to the door, I'm Lola. Holly. She murmured, closing my bedroom door behind her. A mixture of vampire and witch, my half-sister was much like me, though she didn't have the loyalty and strength of an entire pack standing behind her. I wanted to trust her, I wanted to believe that I wasn't alone in this but I had to remain cautious. Whether I could trust her or not changed nothing. She was family, and she would not be left behind. Chapter 93 Tristan had stopped by later on in the day, and I set my plan in motion. I was becoming impatient, each passing day increased my anxiety. The silver bands around my wrist kept me separate from Maddox, though I didn't have enough information to give him at the moment. Worst case scenario, I'd use the shadows to contact him, but I needed to find out the location of the warehouse and when the vampires planned to AK. I nearly ambushed Tristan as he came into my room, asking begging him to give me any information he could. I could see the indecision in his eyes, and nearly screamed as he stormed from my room. The next few days went that way me begging Tristan for his help, only for him to storm out. Each time, I could see the indecision burning in his eyes. I wasn't sure I could ever truly trust Tristan, but it was clear he wasn't sure which side he was on. Four days later, I was nearly at my wit's end. I hadn't heard from Holly or my father, making me increasingly worried. Tristan came into my room as he often had a tray of food in his hands. I snatched the glass of blood from the tray first, downing it before I took a deep, ragged breath. The blood rushed through my veins, making my head feel floaty and my body tingle. The blood always sent a surge of energy through me, though I was still powerless with the silver cuffs on my wrist. 
I had to give it to my father, even under the impression my mind was controlled, he was still paranoid. Don't start this again. Tristan grunted as I pleaded with him for the fourth time. Tristan, if Maddox doesn't get this information, it's over. I sighed, rubbing a hand over my face. Even in this large suite, I was a prisoner. What do you think will happen then? Hill AK, and the pack will be overwhelmed. I can see it in your eyes Tristan, you don't want this war. So, help me. Help me stop it. Let's say I help you and your alpha wins, my people would suffer. Tristan snapped, his ocean eyes narrowing into little slits. Countless vampires would be KD. Don't think I haven't heard about Alpha Bran. He would single-handedly fight for the slaughter of my kind of our kind. I don't want that any more than you do. I shook my head. I had too much time to think things over. If Tristan and Giovanni were both questioning the morals of my father's plan, then how many others were thinking the same? Vampires weren't inherently evil, just as werewolves weren't. They all deserved a place in this new world, one where peace was an attainable goal. Countless will d asterisk e either way, that's war. Then what is it you want, Lola? Tristan asked, he sounded confused and exhausted. What is the outcome you're looking for? I want our species to get along, to stop trying to KL one another. I hissed, I want peace. I want vampires and werewolves to wake up in the morning, not fearing for their life. I want the same, Lola. Tristan murmured, his eyes thoughtful. Then help me. I pleaded, forcing all the emotion I held into my words. I channeled my desperation, the overwhelming desire to see my mate again, and the need I felt towards protecting my younger sister. Help me get this information to Maddox. You need to promise me something, Lola. Tristan spoke lowly. Promise me, you'll always have the best interests for vampires in mind. You're not just a werewolf, you need to remember that. I promise. I swallowed, unable to shake the feeling that my words were binding. I want what's best for both of our species. Tristan approached me, his eyes darkening as they met my own. The knot that had been growing in my stomach twisted painfully, and I resisted the urge to flinch away from him. Standing this close to him, it felt too personal and just wrong. The looming threat of my heat was dangling over my head. I had been here for a week already, but had not yet felt the signs of my heat coming on. My patience and courage were running thin, I needed a way out and I needed it now. Tristan leaned down, his lips hovering over my ear. I clenched my teeth together as his breath fanned across my cheek silently wishing it were Maddox who stood this close to me. His words were low, and I strained to hear them clearly. He plans to AK your pack tomorrow night. Your father and his troops will be leaving out at sunset, tomorrow. The main group will AK from the north, your father and another team will venture in from the west and head north. Tristan whispered, he will leave you and Holly here. He doesn't need you until after your Alpha's pack has been demolished. You're at an abandoned warehouse in Screven, South Carolina. The warehouse is just off Morgan Street. Tell your Alpha to prepare himself, that war is coming. The sound of metal clattering to the ground rang out throughout the room. My head snapped down in time to notice the silver cuffs falling from my wrists, the padlock securing them unlocked. As I lifted my head to meet Tristan's eyes, he had already left the room, closing the door behind him. I rubbed at my raw wrists and clambered into the bathroom. I let out a painful hiss as I ran the tap water over my skin. Wounds from silver could heal much slower, but all I had was a raw, painful rash. I couldn't still my frantic heartbeat as I thought of Maddox, and how in just a few short hours, 
I would finally be able to speak with him again. I hid the silver shackles under the bed, curling under the covers as I searched for Maddox with my mind. At some point I had drifted off, to the darkness. Lola. A voice drifted through my head, seductive and deep. The voice called out to my soul, yanking me from my sleep with a rough hand. Lola, are you there? The thick voice of the male was growing stronger, more frantic as he called out to me. My eyes snapped open, awareness flooding into my eyes as Maddox's voice called out in my mind. For a moment, I sat on the bed grinning like an idiot. This was the most comfort I've had all week, and I had truly underestimated how much I missed Maddox's voice. Lola. Maddox hissed, his voice laced with frightened venom. This is the first connection I've been able to make with you all week. Answer me. Maddox. I exhaled a ragged breath, fighting the pain that darted behind my eyes. Tears stained my vision, and pain ran through my chest as I listened to his voice. Goddess, Lola. Maddox groaned, don't scare me like that. I haven't heard from you all week. What happened? Silver cuffs they put silver cuffs on me. I choked out. I closed my eyes and took a few steadying breaths, calming my nerves so that I could give Maddox a rundown of everything that happened. There's so much I need to tell you, but I don't have much time. I didn't have a clue when Tristan would come back, or when these cuffs would need to return to my wrists. I didn't want to tell Maddox about the other side of my heritage over the mind link. I wanted to look into the depths of his dark eyes as I told him what I was, what kind of monster my father wanted me to become. Brianna and Giovanni made it back. Maddox responded, and I left out a choked sob. My father had been good on his word, the thought sent crippling relief rushing through me. Listen closely. I hissed, unable to bask in the joy of my mate's voice, the feeling of him through our mate bond. My father plans on attacking tomorrow night. Half of his men will come from the north, the other will come from the west and try to ambush you. You need to start evacuating people, Maddox. Now. Consider it done. Maddox replied, and I could feel his dread through the mate bond. He wanted this war as much as I did not at all. This war was a necessity. This pack our entire species was being threatened. There was only one way to eradicate a threat like this. To cut the head off the source my father. Where are you, Lola? You can't stay there any longer. I need you here, baby. I need you to come home. I miss you so much. I whispered, feeling a feather light caress through the mate bond. I met an abandoned Macy's warehouse in Screven, South Carolina. Just off Morgan Street. I'll come for you, Lola. Maddox murmured, when I find you, you're never leaving my sight. You know that, right? After all of this, you won't be able to shake me. I chuckled, but quickly turned serious. Maddox, I don't have time to explain the details, but I have someone else here we need to rescue. My half-sister, I can't leave her behind. You know you can't come here, right? You need to stay with the pack, lead them be their alpha. Lola, you're not keeping me away from you. Not again. Maddox snarled, but I could hear the hesitation in his words. He knew I was right, but neither of us wanted to admit it. I wanted him here, more than anything but the pack came first. They needed their leader, they needed Maddox to instill courage, hope and motivation within them. Maddox was the glue that held this pack together, and right now, they needed him more than I did. Maddox, we'll see each other again. I promise. I murmured softly, our pack needs you. What kind of Luna would I be if I put my needs before the pack? 
the link between us went silent for a few moments, then Maddox finally replied. All right. Maddox sighed, his voice heavy. I'll send a group to come and get you both. It's going to take a couple hours, I can't let my men walk in there blind. I'll pull up the blueprints and scout out every exit, and guard locations. By tonight, you'll be in my arms. My sister Holly, she said that once our father leaves with his men, that the warehouse will have little guards. They're leaving at sunset tomorrow. That's our best window, and will cause the least amount of damage. They have me locked in a room, I'm on the eastern side of the warehouse, on the second floor. If you can, try and get your sister in the same room when the time comes. Maddox replied, it'll be easier to get the two of you out without having to scour the warehouse. I'll do what I can. I love you Maddox, so much. I exhaled, sending the rush of emotion through the mate bond. As my hearing increased, and I heard the heavy steps of someone walking down the hall, I called out to Maddox. I have to go, someone's coming. Just as I dove under the bed and emerged with the silver cuffs, my bedroom door opened and Tristan stepped inside. His eyes were still haunted, torn between what he believed and what his king expected of him. Tristan was still insufferable but I had learned more about him than I ever thought possible. I didn't fool myself into thinking I earned Tristan's loyalty, but he had helped me where no one else would. If I had been anyone else, you'd be monumentally screwed right now. Tristan glared at me, his eyes flickering down to the cuffs in my hands. Well, I guess I got lucky. I huffed, do I need to put these back on? You do. Tristan nodded stiffly, your father requests your presence for dinner. Dinner. I grimaced, I thought vampires didn't eat human food. They don't. Tristan spoke darkly, he wants to make sure you're still under my control before he leaves. I'm not sure how, but he's going to test you, Lola. Whatever you do, don't break. Join our Facebook and WhatsApp group for more updates, link is given in description, rest audiobook will be continued in next episode.